Welcome to Counterpoint. I'm Tanya Granick Allen. The ability to work and seek out economic opportunity is an essential human right that should be afforded to all Canadians, including the First Nations. The United Nations recognized this basic right in 2007 when it drafted its Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Persons, commonly referred to as UNDRIP. This declaration states, among other things, that the Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources. So last year, the Liberal government, the federal Liberal government, proposed Bill C-15, a bill which seeks to implement the UN's declaration into Canadian law. But will First Nations right to economic opportunity be respected? Will Bill C-15 allow First Nation communities that rely heavily on work in the energy sector the right to build pipelines, railroads, and other infrastructure that cross First Nations territories? Or will further legislation and red tape deny Canadian First Nations the right to develop their land? Well, later on, I will be joined by University of Saskatchewan professor Dr. Ken Coates. But right now, I'd like to welcome Dale Swampy, president of the National Coalition of Chiefs. Dale, thank you very much for joining us to discuss this uh, this UNDRIP, this topic. Uh, so can you please first tell us how you became involved in the question of UNDRIP and, and C-15, please? Well, I'm the president of the National Coalition of Chiefs. It's a group of pro-development chiefs that work with uh, the natural resource industry in Canada. We um, organized this uh, group to send the message across Canada that coalitions uh, are, are much more um, suited to um, access benefits from major projects. They also have a mandate to uh, defeat on-reserve poverty. We feel that the only way we can defeat on-reserve poverty is to get the Get the family structure back the only way to get the family structure back is to get the dignity of our people back and the only way to get a, the dignity of our people back is to get them back working and the only way we can get them to work is to cooperate and participate in the natural resource industry it includes all facets of nat natural resource industry including oil and gas oil sands uh, met coal mining those type of, of of things as well as mining and um you know Northern Ontario, Northern Saskatchewan, Northern BC. So how important is energy development to the communities that you help? Well, we have uh, in 2016, 12,000 self-identified business workers in the oil and gas industry. And we think that figure has actually grown rather than uh, decrease because of the new legislation, the environmental, social and governance legislation that most companies are now uh, abiding by and they see the importance of uh, getting cooperation and participation from First Nations. Mm -hmm. And as as we move into this and we, we start to get out, out of this poverty and start to get, to get our people working, we're, you know, stopped by this uh, uh, environmental non-government agencies across this country, which is a billion dollar a day uh, industry that's just uh, choking us right now. And just when we're able to get the kind of influence we want within our natural uh, resource industry, including oil and gas, uh, this comes up to uh, hinder our ability to keep, keep on working. You know, recently, the Americans have canceled the expansion of Keystone XL. So how important does that make Trans Mountain to your communities? Well, Keystone XL was important, just like Trans Mountain is. Keystone XL was going to expand, uh, you know, the oil and gas industry in Alberta. The um, effects of, of getting uh, more access to pipelines is, was going to allow us to expand in the oil sands as well as the uh, uh, other types of conventional oil field um, expansions. And when that happens, then First Nation people get employed and our ability to be able to get employed, you know, by the cancellation of uh, Keystone XL was uh, hindered by that, of course. And Trans Mountain now we're relying on in order to get the offshoots of what uh, comes about when you expand uh, pipelines. But not all Indigenous communities were on board for, for the Keystone XL. I recall seeing video footage of, of protests and whatnot. Well, I mean, they're, they're a very small minority, very vocal. I mean, uh, we have, um, I would estimate, 14,000 now uh, self-identified Indigenous workers working right now in the oil and gas industry. You don't hear from them because they're, they're working. Mm -hmm. They're on the job. So the NGOs have just uh, taken advantage of what's happening on our reserves right now, which is poverty, you know, the social ills of poverty, uh, teenage suicides, uh, 
um, drug and alcohol abuse, domestic abuse, murder and missing indigenous women, racism. They are all social ills of uh, what is created by poverty. And we've been in a social welfare society for decades and uh, we got to get out of it. And in order to do that, we need to get our people to work. Well, I want to discuss more on this right when we return from this commercial break. Welcome back. We're discussing UNDRIP legislation, Bill C-15, with Dale Swampy, president of the National Coalition of Chiefs. Uh, Dale, what is your experience when speaking with First Nations communities on how uh, the Canadian government implements laws and uh, designed specifically to protect First Nations communities? How, how is this working out? Well, I mean, you got to go look, look back at the kind of uh, uh, lawsuits that have succeeded for First Nations. Uh, you go to northern BC and you see the kind of um, influence that has been, has been made there with their uh, with their lawsuits and the, the indigenous rights and title has been enforced. Uh, they get a lot more say in what happens in the projects, but I think legally it, it it's it's good for the people to understand that uh, in Canada to understand that this is our land. This is uh, we've been here for tens of thousands of years. We have an inherent right to our lands and resources uh, when when the government makes uh, decisions, legal decisions about uh, certain tracts of lands, they give us an ability to be able to provide input, but there's no incentive to actually uh, provide, um, you know, a, an acknowledgement or a approval of projects. Mm. Um, there is a lot of in, there is a lot of uh, incentives to say no to projects, though, and I think we got to get away from that. And the only way we're going to get away from that is to do what we've been trying to do for the last 70 years. You know, um, <clears throat> when uh, Chief uh, Wilton Littlechild started and got the uh, UNDRIP legislation in uh, the UN, one of the things he was trying to do was trying to get our rights to our land back. And it's all about land. You know, in 1996, the uh, Krechan government did a study about Indigenous uh, peoples and in that study, when they got it back, they recommended that uh, the Canadian government give 30% of the land, crown land, back to the people, including, uh, you know, resources on the on those lands. Mm. And I think that's that's the kind of thing we need to strive towards, you know, <clears throat> trying to do exactly what the Alaska and the 13 bills of Congress did in Alaska for the Alaska tribes, instead of giving them the uh, an overall, you know, um, uh, land titles. Um, settlement right. actually gave them land. They gave them rights to that land, and they gave them additional rights that pointed to uh, natural resource development. Fifty percent of all the natural resource development that occurred in Alaska had to include First Nations. It took them decades to get these corporations to work and actually start making money. But right now, these corporations are making you know all kinds of money, and they've had for the last fifty years an ability to be able to sell those lands at any time. Mm. And they never sold those lands because the lands are important to First Nations people. Yes. We wouldn't sell them privately to a you know, non-Canadian or, in the case of Alaska, non-U.S. individual or so forth. So it's important to us. And I think that's where we really want to go. UNDRIP is just another legal cog in the system that uh, you know, Canadians as well as First Nations are tired of. And does it really give us any advantage? Does it really give us a share of the royalties from our natural resources? No, it doesn't. No, it gives us more say, but we already have that. We have ESG legislation that that provides us with that kind of input. And it's not input we want. We want to protect the economy or the, the environment, but we want to be part of the economy as well. And the only way we can do that is to get a piece of what we owned for thousands and thousands of years, and that's a land and the resources. Well, you mentioned something, uh, you know, a few minutes ago earlier that uh, some of these legislations just really allow you more to say no than to say yes. And, and perhaps that's one of the criticisms of UNDRIP, that it is designed really to let First Nations or it potentially is designed to let First Nations really just say no to energy projects. So how do we let them say yes? Well, we've got to incentivize uh, just like anybody else. I mean, Canada really um, went after the resources of this country because they knew they can make a lot of revenues from it, from the royalties. Um, you know, you get that kind of attitude and give it to uh, First Nations. If First Nations had a, uh, 
piece of the royalties, if they have revenue sharing, like the chiefs have been mm -hmm. asking for the last 70 years, for the last 150 years, that uh, we've exploited the natural resources in this country. We've been asking for the share, share of those resources. And we just haven't been able to uh, get that. And I think that's, that's what we want. And that's what's more important. The situation that occurs right now in Northwest Territories, Yukon and uh, Nunavut and um, you know, Northern BC, Northern Saskatchewan, uh, Northern Manitoba, is such that the the number of people that live there are dominated by the First Nations. Mm. It's a it's a it's equal to what happened in Alaska, and I think we should do what the Alaskan government did and what the U.S. did, and appreciate you know the First Nations title land and give them the resources or give them a share of the resources. Okay, well, well said. We're, we're unfortunately we're out of time, but I really do thank you for joining me today, Mr. Swampy. Thanks for having me. Welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion on UNDRIP, and joining me now is Dr. Ken Coates, Professor of Public Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. Thank you, Dr. Coates, for joining me today. Uh, I guess let's unpack this a little bit further for our guests. So what exactly is UNDRIP and C-15, and how, does, how do they relate to one another? So UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, was uh, passed by the United Nations in, in 2007, ratified by, accepted by Canada in 2010. And essentially, it's about a 25 to 30 year long process where Indigenous people around the world did quite, something quite remarkable. They got together in dozens and dozens of meetings and, and articulated a view of human history that essentially talked about the loss of land, colonialism, paternalism, dispossession, marginalization, all those kinds of really important elements that are, are a critical, critical part of sort of, uh, of Indigenous life, quite frankly, all around the world. So the document came together um, as, a, as a declaration. The declaration doesn't really have any legal status. Con countries can sign on, but it doesn't really make, make anything more than symbolic. It means we, we, we sort of generally promise to adhere to all of this. Mm -hmm. What Bill C-15 is doing is essentially says, let's take UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, with some almost 50 uh, different articles and, and, and specific recommendations, and let's make it part of Canadian law. So that essentially what UNDRIP does is say Canada should operate under UNDRIP principles from this point on, and all of its laws and all of its government's actions should be in accordance uh, with this particular piece of legislation. So do you see any problems with UNDRIP uh, or with its implementation for that matter? Oh, absolutely. Uh, do I see a problem with UNDRIP? I think UNDRIP in many ways is a brilliant statement, one of the best um, so diplomatic statements of the, of the 20th and 21st century. Uh, what happens is Indigenous people came together and shared their view of how, how history had been unjust to them and how it was unfair. Um, so we can kind of all agree with that. I have no problems with the aspirations. Most of the articles are are, are completely realistic and, and, and appropriate. The problem less entirely with implementation. Um, how does this relate to Canadian law? How does it relate to modern treaties? How does it relate to historic treaties? Right. Um, do, does the signing of a treaty in 1870 eliminate Indigenous rights? Does it change Indigenous rights? Um, who are the Indigenous people that are discussed? Bill right. C-15 sort of refers to sort of constitutional issues of First Nations, uh, Métis, and, and, and Inuit. But it's not as quite as simple as that. We have different associations of non-status uh, First Nations in this country and, and some really long-standing problems with whether this actually makes sense. But I'll tell you my major concern, and it's a really big one. I think UNDRIP, as it's currently written, or Bill C-15, as it's currently written, is essentially a promise to break promises. Hmm. Because it talks about, well, we're going to do all of these things. Well, if you actually push down into UNDRIP and say, are we going to do these things? They cost a lot of money. Some of them will be federal jurisdiction. Some will be provincial jurisdiction. Um, some are, we've already done. In fact, some areas of our Canadian law are quite refined in these areas. So it, it's this massive template for how we should change the world for the better. But it, it isn't practical. It has no money attached to it. It has no real substantial accountability attached to it. So I, as, an, as an historian, I'm sick and tired of governments in Canada promising Indigenous peoples and not delivering. I'd right. say that as a non-Indigenous person. Right. And, and, and I think, you know, certainly we can do better. Well, we can do better. OK, so you talk about historical documents. So, uh, like, do we already have a made in Canada Indigenous rights regime and protections prior to signing UNDRIP? Or was this really necessary here in Canada? 
So Canada actually has one of the more substantial uh, Indigenous rights regimes in the world. It's far from perfect, and anybody who works in the area and all Indigenous leaders will tell you there's real faults with it. Right. Uh, some of it is, is deeply embedded, like the Indian Act, which is, continues to, to uh, manipulate Indigenous lives in ways that are not very supportive and protective. But we have things like uh, a duty to consult and accommodate which essentially recognizes Indigenous interest in resource developments on their traditional territories. We have modern treaties that, quite frankly, go way beyond what UNDRIP sort of specifies in, in many respects, but not all respects. Um, and, and we have a whole series of measures, whether it's on housing, Indigenous education, Indigenous health, that actually are way beyond what most countries in the world provide for Indigenous people. We also have very bad outcomes. You know, so just because government provides services or provides financial support doesn't mean that things are actually getting better or staying staying right. successful. So, so our model is not working very well. No, I and I I think you spoke very well there when uh, th when you suggest the models were not w working very well. We hear continually, I mean, at least through the news headlines, you hear about it during election time that something's not right. And you know, I growing up, I kept wondering, well, when are we going to fix? Uh, our relations with the Indigenous persons. When are we going to make things better? Uh, we're going to continue this discussion right when we return from this commercial break. Welcome back. We're finishing our discussion on UNDRIP Bill C-15 and what it means to the Indigenous persons in Canada. And joining me again for this uh, remaining discussion is Dr. Ken Coates, Professor of Public Policy at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Dr. Coates, again, thank you for joining us. But when we talked about UNDRIP, you mentioned that it was sort of this um, model, or maybe a guide. Um, so was it ever designed to be directly implemented into law? Uh, or is it, again, just more of a benchmark, more of a global, global guide? You could hear all sorts of different answers from lots of different people. When when it came in under in 2007, there was a lot of opposition to the fact that Canada did not accept it. United States, New Zealand and Australia did not accept it. And a real pushback from all these countries. And when it came back to Prime Minister Harper was the Prime Minister at the time, and he accepted it as an aspirational document. Okay. It's the kind of thing that talks about things like human rights, um, you know, general principles, high-level standards, et cetera, et cetera. And, and an, an aspirational document is a, is a good description of what UNDRIP is. We should aspire to be this better world. We should aspire to more equity and fairness. But, of course, the, the rubber hits the road when you sort of say, okay, what does this actually mean in practice? Right. So UNDRIP includes some very strong language about the fact that Indigenous languages should be preserved. Absolutely right. We should have done this 40, 50 years ago. We should have done everything we possibly could. Is the government of Canada prepared to put several billion dollars into the preservation, enhancement, and retention of Indigenous languages? Um, I don't think so. We've got a new Indigenous languages law. It's a tiny step in that in that direction. Mm -hmm. So I, I, this is where the frustration comes, is the aspirations are fine, but how do you actually get there? And, and does this process, does the Bill C-15 process, actually have the strong support of Indigenous people across the country. And that's that part's a bit uncertain. Well, okay, well, let's go to that. Um, well, first of all, just to wrap up uh, about this aspirational document, I think that's an interesting distinction to make, that just because there's this um, declaration, there's a difference between declaration and, say, a convention or something that is aspirational versus something that's been ratified into Canadian law. And this is, is like you aptly said, as an aspirational document. So it, it's, it's not legally binding on Canada. But now, again, we have C-15. So let's pivot to that. Uh, so with C-15... How do you feel that it is going to impact the sovereignty of the and the rights of, of Canadian Indigenous persons? So that's a really interesting question. Um, right now, Bill C-15 is a very thin document. It essentially is a very symbolic sort of piece of legislation. It's okay. a, a virtual signaling piece of legislation. It says we're going to do really good things things and we're going to tell parliament what we've done and we're going to report back on a regular basis. I don't find that particularly respectful. No. Um, I would have liked to have seen a Bill 15 or a C-15 document that said we're going to take UNDRIP and here's what we're going to do about it. We're going to move on these things first. We're going to move on these ones second and these ones third. We're attaching this much money to it or this much legislative priority. Right now, it is just entirely vague. So what will happen? Who knows? You know, the, the First Nations that are sort of enjoying the greatest sort of self-government and autonomy mm -hmm. and, and, and real opportunity in their own homelands are in the territorial north. 
They're in the Yukon Northwest Territories of Nunavut. We've actually, within Canada, before UNDRIP, have actually negotiated arrangements that provide Indigenous people with a much fair, I didn't say perfectly fair, right. but a much fairer sort of balance in terms of rights and opportunities. We're already doing that in a whole bunch of places. Now what happens is, do governments keep doing these kinds of things? What happens when you go to court and a First Nation stands up and says, you, you're, not, you're not following UNDRIP. UNDRIP says we should do this and that. Um, there's so much confusion in there. Right. The whole business of free, uh, free pirate informed consent uh, about resource developments, infrastructure developments, and even government legislation. We haven't even had the beginnings of a conversation about what this means for Canada. Okay, well, we, we only have, unfortunately, a half a minute left before we, we wrap up. But, uh, you know, we heard from uh, uh, Mr. Dale Swampy just before, and he was suggesting that this might actually prevent uh, prosperity within Indigenous com uh, communities, that it lets really nations, First Nations groups say no and not say yes to a lot of the national energy projects. What are your thoughts on that in the 20 seconds we have left? Oh, I, I, I wish we realized that most First Nations, in fact, desperately want and need carefully done, environmentally sound uh, resource development. Um, what the government keeps from trying to help out and every time they help out, they make things more difficult. B60, Bill C69 made diversity more difficult. B15, C15 could make it more difficult. Um, we've got to stop believing that government has all the solutions. First Nations, Métis, Inuit have the solutions. Empower Indigenous governments and we'll see a much better future. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining us today. More than welcome. Bill 15 still isn't law. It still has to pass third reading, but by all indications, it probably will. And then it will be going to Senate for potential amendments. And if it's passed, it'll become law here in Canada. We'll have to keep on this topic to see how it's actually going to be impacting Indigenous peoples on the ground. For CounterPoint, I'm Tanya Granik-Allen.